of work as the coronavirus pandemic tops 1 million cases worldwide. Weekly unemployment claims in the United States continue to set records. We have team coverage. From the epicenter, a report from New York, the U.S. city hit hardest by COVID-19. Final appeal, new details in Cardinal George Pell's court case in Australia. And joyful and faithful, in a time of uncertainty, Pope Francis has encouraging words for Christians. On EWTN News Nightly for Thursday, April 2nd, 2020. Good evening and thanks for joining us tonight. I'm Tracy Sable. The number of worldwide coronavirus cases grows to more than 1 million. Over 236,000 people in the U.S. have tested positive for the virus. That is the most of any country. And just last week, a record-breaking 6.6 .6 million Americans applied for unemployment benefits, raising the jobless rate to a whopping 10 million in two weeks. White House correspondent Owen Jensen starts our team coverage tonight. Owen? Tracy, the White House continues to battle bleak numbers, the death toll, infections, job losses. The enemy indeed is elusive. The energy sector pummeled by slumping demand, under two bucks a gallon at the pumps. President Donald Trump, who will meet with U.S. oil and gas company execs tomorrow, tweets out support for the energy sector. Just spoke to my friend, MBS Crown Prince of Saudi Arabia, who spoke with President Putin of Russia, and I expect and hope that they will be cutting back approximately 10 million barrels and maybe substantially more, which, if it happens, will be great for the oil and gas industry. Gas prices aside, growing evidence now that people who are infected with the coronavirus but have no symptoms can spread the virus. This as the competition for masks and other medical equipment intensifies. About a half dozen nurses at a San Jose, California hospital staged a protest to say they need more protective gear. We don't want to be spreading it ourselves, so we just want to have the right um, PPEs. And the dangerous work taking an emotional toll as well. Every single day going home, you know, I haven't, you know, kind of like kiss or hug my daughter for two, three weeks. I go home, shower, go up to my own room. It's really hard. The Federal Emergency Management Agency, FEMA, has asked the Pentagon for 100,000 body bags because of the possibility funeral homes will be overwhelmed. And as if the coronavirus wasn't enough to contend with. We're just saying, don't do it. Don't do it. President Trump sent a stark and unequivocal warning to Iran after he accused the country of planning a sneak attack on U.S. military troops in Iraq, saying they'll pay a price, including one that came not too long ago. But we hit very, very hard five massive, major ammunition sites. And a lot of people went with it. A lot of bad people. 10 million Americans have been tossed out of work in just the last two weeks alone. 90% of the population is basically told to stay at home. On a positive note here, 85,000 medical volunteers in the state of New York have stepped forward to help out many of them from out of state. Tracy? Thank you, Owen. Correspondent Owen Jensen reporting tonight from the White House. Well, House Speaker Nancy Pelosi announced this morning that she is establishing a special House committee. It will oversee the government's spending of coronavirus aid money. And right now, plans are in the works for the next bill. Capitol Hill correspondent Eric Rosales reports. House Democrats are moving rapidly on plans for a fourth coronavirus relief bill, with House Speaker Nancy Pelosi eager to put her imprint on the legislation. The governors and the cities and municipalities need resources. They have a job to do without the coronavirus. So with this additional challenge, they need more resources. Some Republicans say Speaker Pelosi's new proposal would roll back the state and local tax deduction cap, helping wealthy individuals, including residents in her own district, and perhaps even the speaker herself. Democrats are putting infrastructure at the center of the next bill, with priorities like water systems, roads, bridges, energy grid security, and expanded access to broadband internet to help the three million children who don't have internet access. Something California Senator Kamala Harris told me she would support. So while they're all home, supposedly online learning, three million of our children are not. And they're gonna be forever left behind. 
It's going to take forever for them to catch up. Senate Majority Leader Mitch McConnell is pouring cold water on the idea of a quick deal. He calls Speaker Pelosi's laundry list of ideas, quote, premature, adding, quote, she is taking advantage of the crisis to do things that are unrelated to the crisis. Sentiment shared by House Minority Leader Kevin McCarthy during a phone news conference. He said, quote, I know the Speaker is trying to talk about a fourth bill. I don't think that's appropriate at this time. The three bills we just passed, we have to implement them. The Democrats' bill could come to a vote on the House floor within weeks. The House is scheduled to be out until April 20th, but Democrats plan to take the bill to the floor shortly after that. At the Capitol, Eric Rosales, EWTN News Nightly. In the state of New York, now the epicenter of the coronavirus, the death toll has surpassed 2,000, with a total of 92,000 confirmed cases. The city is scrambling to put measures in place as the president warns of a very difficult two weeks ahead. EWTN News correspondent Colin Flynn is in Manhattan for us now. Colin, how is the city preparing? Good evening, Tracy. Yes, here in New York City, already hospitals are stretched to capacity. I'm standing on Fifth Avenue, and at the top of the avenue is Central Park, where they have built an overflow hospital out of tents. Already, they're taking COVID-19 patients. This morning, Governor Cuomo made the announcement that the city only has enough ventilators to last for the next six days. And before we came on air, I spoke to Dr. Steve Casabadias. He works at Mount Sinai Hospital in Astoria, Queens, which is one of the worst hit hospitals in this battle against the virus. They ask me, you know, when is it going to end? And I say, it's July, June, July. And everybody's shocked when I say that. But the reality is, I see no end in sight right now. Uh, as for the staff and the doctors, we're numb at this point. We're numb. We're numb. The, the death has made us numb to everybody. Dr. Casabadias went on to reiterate the message that we are hearing again and again from the experts. And that is, if we want to save lives, we have to keep our distance. That is something that has been reinforced here in New York today when it was announced that all playgrounds will now be closed until further notice. Also, guidelines released today to all medical emergency responders that if they're trying to resuscitate someone who is in cardiac arrest using CPR and that fails, the emergency responders must now not bring that person to the medical emergency room in a hospital. And I think that is something that has shocked many people here today. And Tracy, it has really hit home the severity of the medical emergency that awaits New York City. Well, Colin, an absolutely tragic situation there. Um, on a different note, Colin, we've seen your reports on EWTN over the years, and it is great to officially welcome you to the team as EWTN news correspondent. Welcome, Colin. We really appreciate you being here with us. Tracy, it's an honor for me, and thank you very much. A plane load of medical equipment and masks from Russia arrived at New York's JFK airport this morning. The arrival of the supplies follows a phone call between Russian President Vladimir Putin and U.S. President Donald Trump yesterday. Russia's foreign ministry says the U.S. may be able to help Russia if it needs assistance in fighting the coronavirus pandemic. Japan's capital is reporting 97 new cases of the coronavirus. It is the biggest surge of cases in a single day in Tokyo. Officials are scrambling to find more hospital beds for the expected increase in patients. The Prime Minister of Britain is still in isolation and still showing symptoms a week after he announced that he had COVID-19. He wants more testing, but not just for the virus. What we need to do is massively ramp up, not just tests, so that you can know whether you've had the disease in the past, the so-called antibody test, because that will enable you to go to work in the confidence that you can't uh, be infected or, in, or infectious. Second, uh, people need to know uh, whether they haven't got it, uh, rather than isolating themselves at home uh, for no reason. And very Boris Johnson tested positive last Friday after developing a fever and cough. Uh, Israel's Health Minister Yaakov Litzman has been diagnosed with COVID-19. He has had a lot of contact with Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu. Both men are now in isolation. Several other top Israeli officials are also being asked to self-isolate after coming in contact with Litzman. 
Australia's highest court is expected to rule next week on the appeal of the most senior Catholic clergy member convicted of sexual abuse. Cardinal George Pell is one year into a six-year prison sentence. The high court is expected to deliver the verdict on his appeal next Tuesday. It could be the last chance for the 78-year-old to clear his name. The Vatican authorizes priests to recite a new prayer during this year's Good Friday liturgy and celebrate a special mass for the afflicted in the time of pandemic. The Congregation for Divine Worship issued the decree signed by Prefect Cardinal Robert Seurat. Cardinal Raymond Berg, patron of the Sovereign Military Order of Malta, joins us now from Rome on Skype. Your Eminence, thank you so much for joining us. Oh, you're most welcome. Happy to be with you. I know many people have been self-quarantined for about a month now. What's your message or your advice for people right now to combat the coronavirus pandemic? Well, simply to encourage them in their homes if they're not able to leave their homes to create regular times of prayer and especially devotion. And I would recommend particularly the enthronement of the image of the Sacred Heart of Jesus and the devotions to the Sacred Heart of Jesus, which are also Eucharistic devotions and a way of expressing uh, our, our love for our Lord and our desire once again to be able to, to take part in the Holy Mass and receive Him in Holy Communion. What apostolic initiatives would you promote to priests in these extreme circumstances? Well, to the, to the degree that they, they are permitted to, uh, to offer to the faithful uh, times in the church, I'm not sure. I think from place to place it differs. Some places I'm told the churches are absolutely closed so that people cannot uh, enter the church. If they can't, then that the priest could send either by mean, like electronic means or whatever communication he's able to use helps to the people devotion, psalms that they could pray, also prayers against uh, uh, the pestilence, uh, prayers to St. Rock, for instance, who's the patron saint against pestilences and, and, and other prayers that they could offer, uh, prayers to our blessed, asking the intercession of our blessed mother and so forth, but to try to, to let the people know that the priest is, is, is there for them, even if he's not permitted to actually see them or come near them, that he's praying for them and he's trying to, to help them as a good shepherd. Yeah, and we're getting so close to Holy Week. How can we celebrate this Easter season when we can't go to Mass and sacraments may not be available? That uh, uh, has to be for us the, the, the deepest source of suffering. Uh, all that I can say is that if there is no way possible in which to to be united uh, with the with a priest in, in in the celebration of these sacred liturgies to try to to follow them through the television or through the uh, computer uh, and at the same time uh, at home uh, to uh, say prayers uh, as they would be said in church uh, to read the read especially the passion of our lord and uh, especially, for instance, on Holy Thursday, the accounts of his institution of the Holy Eucharist and of the Holy Priesthood, and on Good Friday to uh, read the whole Passion, especially to commemorate his, his suffering and dying for us, and uh, then on, on the Easter Vigil to, to keep a vigil with our Lord, praying the Rosary, praying, uh, saying other prayers uh, uh, in order to, to be united to our Lord in, the, in these most uh, holy days, these uh, days of very strong grace for us that we have now to, to implore in an extraordinary way because of this pandemic. Well, Your Eminence, thank you so much for joining us. We really appreciate speaking to you and getting your insight. Cardinal Raymond Burke, patron of the Sovereign Military Order of Malta, thank you again. You're most welcome. God bless you. Coming up... Pope Francis tells us why it's so important to say yes to God's call. Plus, we hear about a new initiative from the president aimed at Catholics. Pope Francis reminds the faithful that they have been chosen by God to be joyful and faithful. Non siamo cristiani perché siamo stati eletti. 
At the Holy Father's Daily Mass, he said, we are Christians not just through baptism, but also when we say yes to what God asks of us. This call is nourished by our faithfulness, which is shown in good works and a relationship with our Lord. Pope Francis also prayed especially for the homeless hidden from society during this time of sorrow and fear. The Democratic National Committee is postponing the party's presidential convention. It will now be held the week of August 17th, a week before the Republican convention, and will still take place in Milwaukee. The Democratic convention was originally scheduled for the week of July 13th. It was moved in response to the coronavirus pandemic. Meanwhile, the Trump campaign is reaching out to Catholic voters ahead of the presidential election. Catholics for Trump, a coalition dedicated to recruiting and activating the Catholic community in support of President Trump's re-election bid is hosting an online broadcast tonight to launch the effort. Joining me now on Skype is Matt Schlapp, co-chair of Catholics for Trump. He is also the chairman of the American Conservative Union. Matt, welcome back to the show. Good to see you. Great to be with you, Tracy. All right, Matt, so let's talk about the significance of this outreach. How important is the Catholic vote to President Trump's re-election? Well, you could view it as the ultimate swing con constituency in the country. Uh, oftentimes, as goes the Catholic vote, determines who's the next president. And uh, there's no question that polls demonstrate that Catholics who are practicing their faith, who go to church regularly, like the policies that they've seen under President Trump. Matt, what can Catholics look to see from the Trump administration on issues that are really important to us, such as protections for the unborn and religious freedom? Yeah, I mean, the, the very first question is uh, religious protections or protections of our First Amendment religious freedoms. President Trump has been uh, as strong in defending these rights as any politician we've really ever seen. And, uh, and it's so appreciated at a time when society, or at least the kind of the, uh, some of the leaders of society um, from the East Coast and from entertainment are so hostile towards Catholics and so hostile towards people of traditional faith uh, uh, orientation. And, and when it comes to the question of life, of course, you know, there's nothing more important in America than the idea that each individual created by God uh, gets its due dignity. And President Trump has been one of the most aggressively uh, you know, uh, most aggressive presidents when it comes to upholding the right to life and keeping the government away from actually funding abortion, which is what Joe Biden and the Democratic Party want to do these days. Yeah, I'm sure you're familiar with our poll that we did. And based on that data from the EWTN News Real Clear Opinion Research polling, devout Catholics represent, along with evangelicals, uh, one of President Trump's most steadfast bases of support. What would be your message, Matt, to those Catholics who are maybe undecided at this point? I think for those Catholics who are undecided, um, they ought to look at the issues that concern them the most in our society and around the globe. And I think for the overwhelming uh, percentage of Catholics who practice their faith, who go to Mass, who are active in their parish, uh, it's this question of being able to practice your faith without the government telling you what you can and can't pass on to your kids, what can and cannot be said in a pulpit. Uh, you know, we're in a very dangerous place in certain segments of this society. And for a Democratic Party that literally has erased the term God uh, from its platform, from a Democratic Party that wants to make sure, you know, even uh, Joe Biden himself has gone from, from the idea of, of stopping uh, government funding abortions through the Hyde Amendment to now actually supporting our taxpayer dollars being used to kill unborn children. These are the twin pillars of upholding any sense of decency in this country. And I'm proud to be a Catholic standing with Donald Trump in both of these areas. Well, Matt, quickly, before we wrap up, I know the event was canceled last month because of concerns of the pandemic, but instead tonight you're holding a virtual event. Uh, can you talk about how you balance re-election efforts in the middle of this crisis? Well, I think for Catholics in the middle of this crisis, our faith is more important now than ever. And as we watch these briefings coming from the White House each and every day, most of us are watching, millions and millions uh, of people are watching, lots of Catholics are watching. I think we all are turning to our faith more than ever. So I know politics is a little bit of a dirty word in our society at times, but 
at moments like this, it's very important. And what I would say is as Catholics, we want to uphold those elected officials, be they Republican or Democrat, who are doing the right things to make sure that we're all safe. And in that vein and in that spirit, we should reward politicians who turn to God and who say that it's God who will protect us, because that's what we all believe. And understanding that that's one of the things that is so great about America and our freedoms in, in America uh, is, one once again, one of the reasons I'm really proud to be a part of this effort of Catholics for Trump. Well, Matt, thanks so much for your time. We really appreciate it. Matt Schlapp, co-chair of Catholics for Trump. Thanks again, Matt. Thanks, Tracy. Up next, we remember St. John Paul II on the anniversary of his death. The coronavirus pandemic has touched virtually every country in the world with the number of cases rising daily as well as the death toll for reporters. Covering this story is truly like no other. Alejandro Bermudez, executive director of EWTN's Aussie Group, joins me now by Skype. Alejandro, welcome back. Great to see you. Thank you for having me, Tracy. Uh, just yesterday, Pope Francis offered a prayer for media professionals covering the coronavirus pandemic. As a journalist, what does this mean to you, and also as a Catholic? Well, uh, both as a journalist and a Catholic, it's uh, extremely encouraging to see Pope uh, Francis uh, doing this and praying for us. You know, it really touched uh, home for me and my colleagues uh, because it, it demonstrates that the Pope is aware that uh, beyond the uh, beyond what they see in uh, in in media, especially in, on the internet, there are people behind. There are people uh, which are my my colleagues and myself, who have families, but at the same time have to be concentrated in providing the news information that that Catholics need. Can you talk a little bit about what it's like covering this story for you? You know, a story of this magnitude. Well, no, no precedent whatsoever. These are things that I've never seen in my life. I've been more than 30 years in Catholic journalism, and uh, this is just absolutely incredible to see the Holy Father walking all by himself in an empty St. Peter's Square. Uh, but the most important thing has been not only transmitting this uh, presence of the Holy Father and bishops and priests, trying to reach out to people, but also to clarify a little bit of the confusion that many Catholics feel about what is going to happen for Holy Week, how is it going to be celebrated. So we are constantly reporting of how is, how is that going to be dealt by the Holy See, how is that going to be dealt by uh, particular dioceses in the United States and around the world. Um, can you talk about the role of Catholic journalists during this time of crisis? You know, what kind of unique responsibility do you think we have? Uh, two things, I believe. Uh, number one is uh, providing the news the where the where they are and the way Catholics need it. As you know, there is an overflow of information about coronavirus. Sometimes that gets pretty confusing. You know? So. What we want to provide is the news that not, not, not other outlets are providing, which is, as I said, related to, uh, to the, uh, the celebrations, related to the norms and regulations that are being applied in this time of coronavirus for Catholics and for the church. And number two, the other one is to provide hope. I mean, the, the fact that our news agencies across the uh, EWTM family in different languages have seen an incredible uptake of traffic. It's not only because people need the information, it's that they need hope, being most of them quarantined in their houses. So the fact that we can transmit good examples of priests that are doing uh, phenomenal sacrifices to reach out to the people, still conserving the social distance that have been required, or what the Pope is doing every single day by celebrating Mass all by himself, and picking all these different issues to pray for, that, that's a source of uh, hope that uh, we are very happy to transmit. Absolutely, we definitely are. Alejandro, thank you so much. Alejandro Bermudez, Executive Director of EW10's Aussie Group. Thank you, Tracy. God bless you. 
And a reminder, EWTN airs Masses throughout the day. Mass airs at 8 a.m., noon, and 7 p.m. Eastern from Our Lady of Angels Chapel in Irondale, Alabama. We are also airing the Pope's Daily Mass and a novena from Our Lady of Lourdes. In addition, we are offering Eucharistic adoration from 9 a.m. to 6 p.m. on our website, EWTN.com. And finally tonight, today is the 15th anniversary of the death of St. John Paul II. The Cardinal from Poland was elevated to the papacy in 1978. He became the most traveled pope in history. John Paul II died in his Vatican apartment in 2005. He was 84 years old. Pope Francis canonized him in 2014. We thank you for watching tonight. For the entire EWTN News Nightly team, I'm Tracy Sable. We're back tomorrow with more news from a Catholic perspective. We leave you tonight with more images of the Polish Pope. St. John Paul II, pray for us. Good night and God bless.